Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Around the Jewish World in 613 seconds. Today we are traveling 5,597 miles from Jerusalem all the way to Canada, to Montreal, to meet Rabbi Noff and Ori Fruchter. So, hi guys, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you guys doing? I'm well, thanks, and it's great to be on your program. Fantastic. Yeah, I love the idea, and I'm happy to participate. Well, I must say, Oli, you've gone to town with an amazing backdrop, and Montreal looks like a beautiful city. Rabbi Nov, you look like you're in one of your children's bedrooms. It also looks nice. But <laughs> perhaps you could both share with us a little bit of an insight. What is Montreal like? What's it like to live as a Jew in Montreal in the year 2020? I'd say one of the things which really struck me when I got here, which contrasted with the other places I've lived, is the divide, not in terms of a conflict, but just the different Ashkenazi and Sephardi communities. Um, overwhelmingly, the Sephardi communities are Francophone, their first language is French, and they have that very strong culture. And then you have the Ashkenazi community, which is overwhelmingly Anglophone. So even though I did GCSE French, I managed to forget all of it and not even learn any of it over the last four years. Like virtually nothing has come back. It's, it's shameful. And Jews have been living in Montreal for centuries, since the 18th century, I believe. Perhaps all you could just give a little bit of an insight. What's it like living there now? Is it a great place to live? Yeah, so I was actually going to say, um, one of the things that I love, as a Montrealer, born and raised, um, I actually love the fact that you could walk around the city and really see uh, the impact and the, the actual remnants of the Jewish communities across the whole entire city, from like the plateau area where the Jewish community originally moved and lived, all the way to where the large percentage of Jewish communities lives today, including Luke and Hampstead, where we have our little sort of internal communities and areas. Um, but it's really actually quite unique as to the fact that regardless of where you are within the religious spectrum, um, you identify yourself as a Montreal Jew. And we actually very much have an accent and enunciation and pronunciation that differentiates ourselves. Um, so connected to the Sephardim, you actually could go anywhere around the world and when a Montrealer Sephardi speaks, you actually recognize that unique accent that really is special to being a Jew in Montreal. And if I'm not mistaken, you have some fabulous weather in the winter, it gets pretty cold. And I, I assume you're a great ice skater and you speak fluent French? Um, my Hebrew is actually probably better than my French. I lived in Israel for eight years. But um, yes, but I definitely, skiing, skating, all the winter sports is something that I do very much cherish, 100%. The weather in Canada gets really cold in the winter from a practical um, sense. Is that a challenge in terms of going out to shore when it's minus 15, minus 20? What's that like? Keep going, keep going. Minus 30, minus 40. There's no question it's made a very, it has a very big impact and it impacts on, obviously on personal life, but very much on communal life. I mean, my, again, uh, my community has a lot of older people, which makes a difference, but it makes a difference for everyone. Uh, basically, what happens in the winter is this, you have a lot of people, especially older, but not only who just don't want to leave the house, they want to stay home and, and stay warm. You, you also have many people around the age of between 65 and 80, a very high number of people who go to Florida and they, they leave around November time, and they come back for Pesach, maybe even after Pesach. Currently, it is plus 30 in Montreal, and people don't know what to do. <laughs> in the winter time, when it's minus 30, people know to get dressed up and still go out and have fun. I have celebrated New Year's at the Old Port when it was minus 30, and I just needed to layer up and make sure I was dressed accordingly. So. I think if depending on your perspective or depending on who you ask, people know how to handle the cold and we won't let weather, whether it's hot or cold, stop us from doing what we want and enjoying what we want. Now, I spent Shabbat in Montreal about 15 years ago with my Hasidic cousins. I know there's a big Hasidic community there as well. And I have the most amazing Shabbat and weekends and experience. Perhaps you tell me now, Rabbi Noff, what's it like if I was to come and spend a Shabbat in Montreal now? What's life like there for a Jew? What's life like there in terms of infrastructure, education, kashrut, and all the things that you need in a Jewish community? You have very different communities. So you could go to stay with your Hasidic cousins again, and you have different Hasidic groups. Uh, Tosh, I don't know where your cousins were from, but the Tosh Hasidim are basically, they are based in uh, Montreal and the Tosh Rebbe 
um, is in Montreal. There was a famous Tosha Rebbe, the previous one, um, world famous, and he, he was based here. Then you have other communities um, of all different sorts. Um, you have a, a pretty good infrastructure in terms of the federation, which is connected quite broadly to the communities, um, and the schools work together pretty well. Uh, you have a big range of schools. I've got kids in all different kinds of schools, so you kind of work it out for each child what suits them best. In terms of cash routes, so it's pretty easy. You have uh, we have COR, which is one of the cash routes organizations, and also MK, um, which in this context is Montreal Kosher, uh, and that's therefore it's quite easy to get the products you need. Uh, the number of restaurants, if we're going to go into that, is not the same as in London. You, you don't have any comparable to um, the kind of Brent Street, um, Gordon's Green Road, uh, some of the places in Edgware where just every every building is another Jewish eatery. So you don't have, because frankly, I think because we have uh, you know fewer Jews, we have about ninety thousand Jews in the community. It's not it's not the same. Um, but um, sushi. The variety of sushi. I don't know, maybe I'm going to probably ask you to speak about Jewish life, but the variety of kosher sushi. Ask a rabbi about Jewish life and he goes straight to the Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to, I have to, can I just add, the one thing that you did leave out is actually yeah. Montreal is known for our kosher meat as well. So right. like MK chickens and all of that, but especially like smoked meat, right? Mm -hmm. Montreal is known for smoked meat and we have our kosher smoked meat that goes with the rye bread and everything else. Uh, so it's definitely part Montreal Jewish community on the map, um, and our bagels, which is something that we've always had and has always been on the map. Uh, so we definitely, the um, the Jewish culture has very much bled and integrated itself into the non-Jewish world and culture as well. Now, um, why is it whenever yeah. I meet somebody from Canada, if I dare say they're American, I get my head bitten off? Why is that such an insult? Because we have a prime minister and not a president. <laughs> I like that. I like that answer. It's a good one. Uh, because we're just different. <laughs> we're the cousins of the North. So we're not, we're not American. Um, but also, it just Canadians are very different. The same way I mean, if you take like an East Coast American and a West Coast American, they're very different. Canadians are just very different. I hear that. In terms of Canadian culture itself, does that find its root within the Jewish community as well? If I were to come to your Shabbat table, would I find any local dishes? Um, definitely. Uh, I would say specifically Canadian also. Where the fact is that there's Jewish communities that date back to Winnipeg, when Canadians were actually led into Canada, that has very much dictated what we do and how we do it. And so, for example, it's also the French twist, essentially, on very European food. So like growing up, doesn't matter where you live, if you were a Montrealer, you know what a cheese bagel and a Montreal cheese danish is. That is so unique to Montreal Jewish communities that friends of mine that now have moved to Montreal from somewhere else or like immigrated to Montreal have actually now taken to loving cheese danishes and cheese bagels. So there's definitely many ways in which our Eastern European culture has come in, but we have actually sort of done that twist to make it more Montreal-esque and French-esque. Um, I'll also add, though, in addition to what Anthony actually had said um, about the community, is I actually, um, I'm the founder of the Moisha House in Montreal. So Moisha House is an international entity that essentially provides young adults and young professionals with a space to live together as roommates and create a house where we're able to provide Jewish events and programming for Jewish exploration. And it is non-religious, it's non-political, and it's really just having that common space to come together and be Jewish in all of its essence and sense. Wow, so you have a lot of young professionals, young working people, students, and other people who have somewhere to really identify as Jews and connect with other fellow Jews. Exactly, um, exactly. Uh, Rabbi Knopf, can you tell us a little bit about anti-Semitism, racism? Does that exist in Montreal? And have you had any experiences of that? 
Yeah, it, it's it's striking how it is less. In other words, I feel it's there's certainly less fear about that than other places I've lived. And it was incredible when we got here. And just the there's a pretty low level of security. And we can sometimes have like say outdoor outdoor events at the shul, and there's a big barbecue, and you've got like a couple of hundred people there, and there's no security there. We do have some on Shabbat morning. So that, that, is, that was something which really struck me when I got here. I can only say that from my experience, I, I hear about very, very little. Uh, also, you know, we, we are, of course, you know, in this part of the world. And so in reacting to what happened in America with the shootings in America and the shuls meant that we, were, we had lots of discussions about upgrading our security. And there is much more security consciousness with regard to that. But, uh, you know, my sense from living here is that it's certainly contrasted with other places I've lived is that we're not living with a sense of a great threat. What would you say is your greatest challenge as a a Jewish community? Uh, I think the great challenge is to keep a vibrant community given the general demographic. The general demographic of the uh, Anglophones in Montreal is, I think, aging because... Uh, since the mid 70s, there has been a movement of, of uh, Anglophones moving away from Montreal for political reasons. Since the uh, the um, party got into power, that that wanted to separate Quebec from the rest of Canada and uh, you know make it into a more of a French province. Um, and so those who are Anglophones have been concerned about opportunities at university, opportunities for jobs, and there's been a movement away. And the result is that in many Ashkenazi communities, including my own, you have an elderly population who's, if they have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they'll typically be living in Toronto or in the United States. One thing that we really did also notice as part of the work I was doing with Moisha House is that similar to the fact that there's a very old generation or older or aging generation, what we've noticed actually is the fact that that concept of community and let's say hosting a Friday night dinner for friends, whether you're observant or not observant, doesn't really exist because oftentimes you're going home to your parents once you get married or your grandparents for that Friday night experience. So some of like the basic community development, um, community rituals that are connected to Shabbat or experiencing Jewish identity as a community is actually something that somehow got lost and it's something that actually we're trying to bring back. So it's interesting because um, people will, will be watching this and wondering how you two know each other. So you're both working on a very exciting project called M Squared. Do you want to just tell us briefly about that? Sure. Uh, so basically, we've been fortunate to be chosen um, and picked by the Montreal Jewish Federation to participate in a formal and informal educator training and leadership training to specifically help us better the experiential education and thought process that goes into the type of events that we hold and organize for our communities. I get the sense from speaking to you both that there's a tremendous sense of unity there. And for my penultimate question, I just want to ask you in a sentence, what does it mean to you to be a Jew? Is that there are deep, profound values within Judaism about how we're supposed to be as people um, based on a particular way of looking at the world. Um, and I, and I, I realize that you know, many people who are Jewish don't share my way of looking at the world. But speaking from my perspective, the view of the world uh, that we were created by Hashem, that we have a role to play in making this world a world in which Hashem's presence is felt and is, is expressed, is brought to fruition through human beings. Being Jewish um, comes with a lot of responsibility. Working generally, uh, outside of the Jewish community, it's really about that onus and responsibility and respect of what it means to be a Jew and having that spotlight on to how we live our lives, what are the values, what are the rituals, uh, what is the love and unity that actually connects the whole entire Jewish world together that actually makes me the most proud and what I actually think means to be Jewish. There are going to be Jews around the world watching this. If you could say to them one message in one sentence, what would it be? For me, I think that now more than ever, with everything that's going on in the world and with all of the racism and hate and uncertainty, it is our opportunity to really be able to show how important unity looks and feels and experiences 
and how we could actually be better when you put the differences aside rather than using the differences to segregate and differentiate between us as a community. Yeah, that, that is beautiful and also would reflect on these times. I mean, this is, these are times when we've been physically alone, but I have had the experience, uh, part of which I just alluded to, but, but much more than what I just alluded to, of feeling connected to many different groups and many different concentric circles uh, of people across the world. And um, I think that there's something very deep there that we have to think, anyone who's had a similar experience has to ask themselves, what does that mean to be, be a part of something, to be a part of the Jewish people, ultimately be part of the world. If I feel a connection, even if I can't be physically together with people, and that, that is, it, it points us towards the spiritual and towards the spiritual connection um, of friendship, of men membership of something bigger that we have. And so I would encourage everyone, I mean, this, this program is fantastic. That's what you're doing. You're interviewing different people from around the globe and giving people a sense of how Jews are living across the world. And we're all part of that people. And there are, you know, there are people who are watching this who will never meet me and never meet Oli and never meet other guests that you have. And yet, nevertheless, we're all part of this one people. And I think we should feel that and really experience that. And I want to also just corroborate what Oli said, that ultimately it moves outwards, it moves to the whole world. And we feel that we're part of humanity, um, that this is not being a pandemic which is distinguished between the Jewish people and the world. And that gets us to reflect on what it means to be a human being. Rabbi Nov, Oli Fruchter, this has been an absolute pleasure. I thank you so much for your time. I wish you ongoing success. And I look forward to come and check out this Moishi house when I'm next in Montreal. Please do, definitely. When you come here, Rabbi Golko, we must tap you out for sushi as well. Sounds like a plan. Thank you very <laughs> much. Eagles. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been a real pleasure. I'm so grateful to you both.